Okay, great. Um, well, it's nice to get a chance to talk to you all. Um, I really appreciate getting to talk, come back to universities and talk. Um, I spent my education at Berkeley, uh, mostly for my PhD and others, but it's um, after spending some time in industry, it's always nice to get, come back and talk in academia. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about uh, Magenta. Uh, I'm a, the lead research scientist in a research group um, that's a part of Google Brain. It's a small research group that focuses on looking at machine learning and artificial intelligence, but specifically in the context of um, creativity and music in particular. Um, and so let me get my slides here. Okay, so Magenta is, Beyond being a research group, we also do it uh, everything in open source, and uh, we explore the role of machine learning in the creative process. And what that really means is that we primarily do research in machine learning models that generate media, so generative machine learning models. And we publish that at top tier conferences. But then we take that and we want to make it accessible, so we open source all of our code on GitHub. And then we also look at how we can take those models and make them more accessible, uh, accessible to creative coders. So we have a framework called Magenta JS uh, that allows people to run these, uh, these interactive creative models, but in um, JavaScript, so you can make web applications. And then every once in a while, we get to do a fun um, demos where we can make like um, plugins or hardware that's specifically geared towards uh, musicians and artists to try to close the loop between artists and uh, the machine learning research to try to have lessons from artists inform the next directions we take with our research. Um, and so we focus specifically on music because a lot of us just like music and have domain expertise there. Um, but we've done some other things, but music is our primary focus. So that's what I'll talk about today. Uh, and we sort of think of our work as part of a, a long continuum of how music has always co-evolved with technology or the way that we express ourselves uh, co-evolves with the tools that we have to express ourselves. So that goes from the earliest bone flutes that are actually uh, older than the oldest stone pottery. So the flute is actually older than soup in that sense. Um, all the way through the piano, which allowed pe people to play in all 12 keys at the same time, or uh, the invention of electricity, creating digital effects, um, and um, things like drum machines and digital workstations. So it's, it's been a long evolution of the types of music we make with this technology. And there's uh, a new set of technology, well, relatively new in the way that we're using it, um, machine learning and artificial intelligence. So the question we have is like, what role does it really have to play? What do we want it to do? And what do we not want it to do? And so there's two views to think about how you can approach um, you know, music through machine learning. One way you can think of music more as like a thing, more as a commodity, where the value is that you create this music and then people consume it, right? And so you just want algorithms to make more of that music cheaper so there's more for people to consume. Um, and then, but there's a lot of downsides from this approach because basically a lot of these algorithms just learn to imitate the data that they're trained on. And so you can have this system where you're just regurgitating the same things that you were already given. Um, and you also have the challenge that that music that you're making is just going to replace uh, musicians with algorithms. Um, we try to lean and gear the research community towards a different uh, version and a different view of, of how this can exist, where music can be thought of as more of a verb or a social process that throughout human history, music really beyond just something to listen to has served as a platform for cultural identity and evolution of individuals, also for social and spiritual connection among those individuals. So the, one of the questions is really, how can we uh, encourage cultural innovation through empowering individuals with new forms of creative agency? And that's the fundamental question that we try to address with Magenta is what can machine learning do for that? And so when we think about that, we think of what across three dimensions, um, expressivity in terms of enabling people to do things that they couldn't do before, interactivity in terms of making things very responsive and adaptivity in terms of being able to uh, change something and hack it to make it your own. And more specifically, you can think of how machine learning can do this in terms of expressivity could be filling in the gaps 
for a novice. So you might not know how to play music, but if you give simple inputs, the model can produce more complicated outputs than you would know how to play by yourself. Or it can mean taking very detailed inputs from an expert um, and then expressing them in new ways that weren't possible before. So we've had some models that are actually, instead of just playing a single instrument, you can like morph in the space between different instruments, which is what that diagram there is trying to show. Um, and then when we think about designing algorithms, we also think about, well, how can we make them low latency with clear controls, intuitive causal controls? Um, and the goal there is that you want to make things that people can actually learn to use. And so in order to learn something, you need quick feedback loops and, and intuitive causal, causal effects for what happens when I turn this thing. Um, and then finally, machine learning models by their definition are adaptive because you can provide them new data and they will adapt to that data. But oftentimes they require training on really large servers uh, and costing a lot of money with a large environmental impact. So the question is, how can we think about designing models from the get-go that are more hackable and require less uh, data to train? So it's more, uh, more sort of a zero-shot end-user programming paradigm. Uh, and just one example of these trade-offs, there's trade-offs between these different facets. Um, there's two uh, relatively uh, famous or popular machine learning models um, that I'll just uh, compare here. Uh, one is this uh, model called Ju Jukebox that was uh, released by OpenAI, which is a model that looks um, in a very black box way at the raw audio waveform and just models that, that waveform. And so on the plus side, it's very expressive because it's very realistic. It has very few assumptions about, about the system and it can model just that waveform in a very realistic manner. But it can only do that at the expense of using very, very large models that require tons and tons of data and take a very long time to actually generate audio. So it could take like nine hours on a GPU in order to generate one minute worth of audio. Um, and so that's very long latency. It's, it's very hard to learn how to use such systems. Um, and you have sort of limited controls. It's more like a radio. You're like pushing the button and you listen to the song. Um, on the other side of the spectrum is um, something like uh, there was a doodle that we released um, through, uh, uh, you know, the main Google homepage. Um, there was an interactive sort of Bach doodle that was trained on Bach corrals such that a user could input individual notes and it would do different harmonizations of those notes and you could tweak uh, them further. So in that situation, you have very structured data. There's very little data it's trained on. It's only these symbolic representations, these notes of the music of a couple uh, pieces. And then the sounds are unrealistic because we just have the notes and you have to play them back using um, some sort of synthesizer or sample pack which is uh, much less realistic than, than real, uh, real audio. Um, but on the plus side, you give the user very detailed control. And it was so uh, interactive and fast, it could actually run in real time in the browser. So people could get a much more interactive experience. So you have this trade-off in these cases between interactivity and expressivity. So our goal here is to think about how can we have interactive and adaptive models without exp uh, sacrificing expressive power. And uh, the approach that we've been taking a lot within the group is to think about using structure within the model to sort of find a good uh, compromise. Um, so if we think of music as a problem, which it's not, it's, uh, but machine learning defines problems as things that you would like to predict. Um, so if we're trying to predict music, um, it's a very difficult uh, situation to predict because uh, a single song is a uh, song. It's running uh, at 44,000 uh, samples per second. So that's about 10 million predictions for a single three minute song, uh, all with a lot of correlations between them. It makes it very difficult. But there's a lot of structure present within that music that we can maybe expose to break this trade off between interpretability and expressivity. Like uh, audio is made of notes, which uh, give, which are related to a score, um, which are based out of a genre, um, maybe a style, a mood of the music. And so we can think of hierarchically modeling each aspect of these representations. So they're not just uh, black box, re 
box representations that the neural network learns, but they actually mean something to people at the intermediate levels. Um, and so I'm going to talk you through some of the work that we've done in this uh, region, just specifically at this one level of representation of saying, I have a bunch of audio waveform, and maybe I'm going to say uh, there's a bunch of notes present. And so I'm going to try to extract those notes from the audio waveform with transcription models and then resynthesize it back into audio using a synthesis model. Uh, and then we can, all, once we have those notes, we can start thinking about what are the relationships between these notes and how can I uh, model those for composition and performance. So starting with uh, the transcription work, the previous state of the art of this approach was to turn this into a machine learning uh, problem by saying, I have a, a raw waveform and I have this, what's known as a piano roll here, which is basically a series of notes that are either on or off. And so I can split those time frames into small uh, windows and then predict at each uh, time step, are these notes on or are they off using the standard cross entropy uh, loss for training. And the problem is that this frame-wise uh, metric for uh, notes, uh, while it is correct in terms of predicting the piano roll, it's not very well matched to, uh, to our perception of accuracy in the sense that if you make errors in terms of the individual frames of which are on or off, what matters most is actually when uh, the notes start in terms of perceptually. And so I'll just demonstrate this with a few examples. Um, I'm going to do my best. I tried uh, setting up the audio last night, but I think uh, I need to just, it's going to play and you're going to hear it through the speaker because I couldn't install the uh, Zoom app on my corporate laptop. So uh, hopefully this audio is okay. You can let me know if it's not. So this is an example of taking a, uh, a bit of music and we're going to reduce the accuracy by just adding a bunch of random frames of short notes to it. And you'll hear it sounds pretty awful. Um, so did you did you hear that all right? Uh, it was pretty good actually, I think. Okay, good. Um, so now here's the same accuracy in terms of the frame-wise accuracy, but it's just going to be the same piece of music, but we're going to have a one note that's wrong, but it's just held out for a very long time. you even heard it but there was there was one wrong note there that was held up for a very long time and as you can tell the two sound very different um, so the question is how do we incorporate training to actually have the loss function better match uh, what we care about which is how it sounds when we play it back and so this is some work uh, that was done a couple years ago by my collaborators and me um, and the the goal here uh, was to or the insight here was to take a typical uh, neural network architecture here. So here we take the audio, we represent the audio in terms of the frequencies present at each moment in time uh, using what's called a spectrogram. And um, then we run it through a, a sort of standard neural network uh, stack, which is convolutions and uh, LSTMs or, or RNN. Um, and it seemed like uh, Ali was going through some of these. So the convolutions are like those giant block diagrams. And the LSTM is a neural network that predicts uh, recurrently time steps. Uh, so it has more temporal dependencies. Um, and so we can do that in two separate heads where one can predict when the note begins and the other can predict at this frame is the note on or off. And we can have those predictions when the note begins then inform this other stack of predictions of is this note on or off? And we can use that to constrain the, um, the predictions such that it's only predicting notes being on or off when a note is predicted to be starting as well. And so doing that, we created a new state of the art where we could uh, do very good uh, transcription even in the wild. So here's an example of Eric, uh, who's also a great piano player working, uh, playing some music just into his cell phone. So very different than the training data. Um, but you can hear that the, you'll hear the original audio and then you'll hear the audio of the transcription and you'll hear that it's quite uh, accurate. Um, 
So since we're in Magenta, we want to go step beyond doing the research as well. Oh, first of all, the re one of the reasons this works is uh, we call data is really um, important for all of these neural networks because we incorporate very little structure into the model. So the model has to learn that structure from data. So it's very important to have lots of data so you can cover all these different edge cases and the model can learn uh, learn the structure just from the data itself. So we worked with the international e-piano competition uh, to release these data sets where they had virtuosic performers that would play in this competition on disc clavier pianos that actually record what notes you're playing while you're playing those notes. And so then you would hear the audio and you have a synchronized recordings of the, the notes that are being played. So then we can learn to predict the notes given the audio. And that was an order of magnitude larger than previous data sets. And so with those, we could also make um, embed these in Magenta JS to allow uh, uh, creating websites and interactive web apps that actually do the transcription as well. So you can go to these uh, that website and actually do some transcription yourself. Cool, so we have notes. Well, now what do we do with them? So let's talk about composition a bit. And what's interesting about music is maybe even more so than, other, than language. If you look at the notes, they draw heavily on repetition and similarity across very long time scales. Um, and there's different types of neural networks that have to address this uh, ability to model this variation over time. We'd mentioned RNNs before, recurrent neural networks that are in the, uh, they're a feed forward network uh, in terms of predicting an output for a given input, but then it passes state through time in order to predict the next output. So the later outputs are dependent upon the previous outputs, but there's this very long causal, or there's very long chain of transformations that have to happen for information about a time step in the past to actually reach that time step in the future. It has to go through n time steps to do so. Um, but in 2017, uh, some uh, of our coworkers at Google Brain uh, developed this uh, architecture called Transformer uh, that uses self-attention to be able to model sequences. And the real value here is it's um, reduced, it changes the bias in a way that it can allow each time step to pay attention to all the previous time steps at once in a very selective, uh, in a very selective way, because it looks at the attention, it creates an attention mask over the entire inputs. So yet at each layer, uh, there's only one step. Uh, basically, it uh, it can look at any previous time step, so it can really model directly very distant inputs. And so we applied, uh, we were, we took this approach to applying to modeling uh, symbolic music or these note sequences uh, called music transformer. Uh, and one other thing is that you notice this piano roll is not language, right? It's a, this image with a bunch of piano roll uh, notes and stuff. So the question is, how do we uh, tokenize or serialize this? How do we turn it into a series of letters um, that we can then model as if it were language? Um, and so we created this vocabulary of thinking about um, registering individual events in terms of turning on a note, turning off a note, changing the strength with which a note is hit, and then also advancing the clock forward. And what this allows us to do is to play music that's, um, that, that amounts that you advance the clock forward can be very fine scaled. So you can go from being on a very strict quantized grid to having very flexible micro timing of your performance. Um, and just to give you a sense of how important that is for uh, the perceptual quality, here's an example of a piece that's big and quantized. It's fine, but you'll notice it sounds a bit robotic. Um, now here it is with the micro timing and velocity variations. So you notice that there's uh, different speeding up and slowing down and small variations that give it that humanity to the performance. So when we encode the data in that representation, um, what we can find is that we're able to model long-term structure much better than we would with just an LSTM. So this is using uh, what's known as an autoregressive model. So it's predicting the next token given the previous tokens. 
We can start with just an original motif and feed that in and then say, what's the next note that comes? And then given the note that you predicted, what's the next note that comes? Um, and so you see with an LSTM, uh, it begins to degrade a low, long short-term memory unit. It begins to degrade quite quickly in terms of its long-term coherence. It just gets worse from there. Um, but if we use the transformer, it can always look all the way back in time um, to re-reference uh, things that it did before. So uh, we get much more long-term coherence. Um, and then the real secret is then we can take that transcription model and we can look at a whole bunch of raw audio and use it tra to transcribe uh, that audio. So we can get thousands and thousands of hours of symbolic music that wasn't previously available. There's only so much aligned music out there. Uh, and then we can train models based on that. And so we can get models that actually have much more long-term coherence uh, to them. So in the, in the spirit of, of giving more uh, intuitive control, we can then also extract like the melody and give that as what we call conditioning or uh, you know, something that uh, a control that the generation is dependent on. So this example was just showing, given a previous note, what's the next note? But we can say, do that process conditioned on needing to play this melody as well. So here's a, a simple melody where then the model is filling in all the rest of the accompaniment. So you can see that the company maintains a lot of coherence over the course of, of the plan. But since it's an autoregressive model, uh, what that means is that when it chooses each new note, there's a random source of noise present in, in that selection process. So we can feed it the same melody and try sampling from it again and get a, a very different output that also is self-consistent. <laughs> see that um, the rhythm is different, but it's, but it's the accompaniment is done in a very self-consistent way. So we have these notes, um, but so far we've been very limited in the approach because we're, we're just looking at, at um, using, we're resynthesizing that audio using just um, pre-recorded sounds of the piano. Um, so we'd like to be able to extend these models to be able to synthesize a range of sounds. We'll start with piano, but um, this is, this is uh, the area of synthesis. And there's a lot of synthesizers out there in the world. Um, you know, if you listen to any music on the radio, a lot of it is actually synthesizers. So why do we need a neural synthesizer? Um, and most synthesizers have a few knobs that are really custom designed for doing a specific thing. But what's neat about a neural synthesizer is that it has, so that um, and those parameters can be tuned to specific sets of sounds. So we can then be learning how to synthesize things that we wouldn't necessarily know how to do just with uh, a couple set of preset knobs. Um, and one classical example of this is a model known as WaveNet. Um, and so what WaveNet does is it's an autoregressive model again. Um, and you can see that process here where it's predicting uh, a sample of the waveform predict, uh, based upon the previous samples of the waveform. Um, and there's a, uh, the arrows you're seeing here are the weights, uh, the, the graph of the weights of the network. So you can see it's using this uh, dilated convolution to create a large context of the, of the amount of uh, input it's looking at in order to predict the next output. And it does this based on some external conditioning signal. Um, it can be unconditional, but you can also control 
um, by controlling the biases of each of the hidden layers, um, you can then control the outputs based on some uh, high level controls. Um, and so the reason it works is this dilated convolution is unlike um, a normal convolution that's not dilated would be like this lower level, lowest level here, where it's looking at all the densely packed uh, nearest neighbors. But dilation looks at uh, a multiplicatively increasing uh, scope of receptive field. So the, the, the uh, space in between the samples is larger and larger. Um, and what this allows it to do is it allows it to look at a very large scope of time without downsampling the signal. Because when we downsample the signal, we create a lot of different aliasing artifacts. So we're not throwing information away, but then we're still able to look at a large context. And then if you think about it, if we have like 60 layers in our neural network here to predict a single output step, then if we're predicting uh, like a minute, uh, I guess that would even be just one second worth of, yeah, one second worth of audio, we're doing that whole process of going through those 60 layers uh, 16,000 times if it's at 16 kilohertz for every second. So it's sort of like we've learned a function to predict that last time step one second away that goes through 960,000 layers of convolution in order to predict that dependency uh, because it has this autoregressive uh, function. So that makes it very expressive as well. Um, but the limitations is that this process is very slow and that we have to, we're doing it one sample at a time, we're running all of this computation. Uh, and you, you saw how many of this uh, has to happen just to make one second worth of audio. It also needs that longer term conditioning in order to know longer term structure because that receptive field that it's looking at, even though it's very expansive, in uh, absolute time, it just equals like 100 milliseconds or so. So if we don't have any conditioning information, the piano just starts to ramble and then it explodes. Um, so it sort of doesn't have any, uh, it doesn't have enough context, long-term information in order to model how these notes should be happening. It just knows how to make notes that sound somewhat realistic. But if we can condition on what notes should be played, we can take some original audio like this. And then we take those notes and we say synthesize those notes and it can do a much more accurate job. So when we uh, put all of these things together, we create a system that goes from waves to notes, which is uh, the interface is called MIDI. That's uh, this, the system of representing notes digitally and then back to, to the waveform. Uh, and that's what the, uh, this paper sort of shows is combining all these different works together. So we take the audio, we do onsets and frames to, to create the notes. Um, then we model those notes with a music transformer. And then we take those predictions of the music transformer and we synthesize them back to audio using a note conditioned wave net. Um, and so then you can get something like this that's generated uh, entirely. This is entirely waveforms being generated by neural network, but with interpretable intermediate representations. So when we think about the expressive, interactive, adaptive axes, we can think about, well, um, it's great in terms of expressivity because we're learning to generate song length, realistic performances. So we're doing new things. Interactivity, we have some pros in the sense that we have some interpretable intermediates, like in terms of the audio, the notes, chords, and melody conditioning. Remember, we could do the melody conditioning with the music transformer. Um, but on the downside, it's, it's much slower than real time because we have several layers of autoregressive models working on top of each other. And then the adaptivity as well, it needs a lot of data to train each of these elements of the component, uh, each of these component elements. And uh, there's little of this data that exists outside of transcription. So um, yes, uh, so what do we do beyond here? How do we think, um, of encoding 
representations that mean things, but moving beyond more expressive than just notes. And how can we make these systems more realistic and responsive? Well, we have a lot of good prior information about audio and signals that we haven't really integrated. And so we can think of, these are just some textbooks that I really like uh, about signal processing. So we can think about how do we integrate them uh, with deep learning to get the best of both worlds to make it more efficient and interpretable. And so that's this work that we call DDSP. Uh, this is on the synthesis side of things, but also representations. Um, and this is called differentiable digital signal processing. And so the idea here is rather than just having a neural network that creates the audio directly, what if we take known signal processing elements, things that are simple like oscillators, filters, um, synthesizers, these types of things. And then we have a neural networks that is this expressive thing controlling those simple elements, such as to make expressive realistic outputs and maybe controlled by a very high level user input. Um, and so these make these systems that are actually modular because we have these different digital signal processing modules. It's interpretable because we know what those DSP elements are and, and what their actions are versus these black box neural networks. And then they're much more efficient because we're using all that prior knowledge so we can use much smaller models that are much uh, faster and don't have to be auto regressive. Um, so what do these modules mean? What are some of these things? Oh, the simplest thing we can think of is just um, like a sinusoidal decomposition of audio. So this might be similar to like a Fourier transform, if you're familiar to a Fourier transform. But what a Fourier transform does is it decomposes audio into, or any signal into a series of sine waves at uh, linearly spaced fixed frequencies. But we can think about how do we, how can we model audio uh, with variable rate frequencies and variable amplitudes? So we have a bunch of these little sinusoidal oscillators. So if they're all lined up in a harmonic series, they might sound something like this. Where actually, because of the way our ear works, it sounds like one object, sounds like one note uh, with a certain timbre. But if we shift those frequencies around, they might sound like multiple things. There's no neural networks here. This is just using these elements to synthesize sounds. And if we get really creative, we can, we can make some trademark sounds too. So that's using hundreds of those oscillators together. Um, but there's an interesting thing, uh, which if, you know, if you've been studying some of the physics and stuff, a lot of inelastic transformations, like anytime you hit something, usually the can be described in terms of a second order differential equation. And the solution to those second order differential equations are actually harmonic oscillation in the sense that it's uh, oscillating, but with uh, frequencies that are interpreter multiples of each other. So you can get these, uh, these situations where many realistic signals actually have these integer relationships among their frequencies. Uh, so we can then think about using that to constrain a system to be harmonic. Uh, and so only having these integer multiples and we can control then the amplitudes of the, all of those together. But then if we change the amplitudes of the different uh, components, but it still sounds like the same sound, but it'll change the, the timbre of that sound. So, uh, sound is not just periodic components, it's also uh, got a, a noise element. So, we can think about taking just random uh, white noise and then shaping it with different filters. So, here's like a filter, uh, like this is a cutoff filter here, um, but we can do it in arbitrarily time bearing filters. So, here's just an example of that. Um, again, these are just all arbitrary that I just did by hand, um, but it's just showing you how expressive it can be. So what we can do is then we can take this system and we can think about how can we put this into a neural network situation. So we can take these elements in yellow that are the DSP elements, and what we can do is we can control them using a neural network that we call a decoder. And the controls into that decoder uh, can be from the target audio, we can extract features like the frequency, the fundamental frequency, the pitch of the audio, and maybe the loudness of the audio as well. And so we can use those as the controls to then control these synthesis elements. Um, and then we can look at the original audio and the audio that's synthesized by these synthesis elements. And we can compare how close do their spectrograms look to each other. And then use that as a loss to back, to back propagate through and correct all the values of this decoder 
such as to make the target more similar or to make the synthesized audio more similar to the target. Um, so this allows us to do high quality synthesis uh, with also very much less data because so, we're not using auto regression and it's much more efficient. So just an example of this, we could take like 10 minutes of uh, violin playing here. Here's the spectrogram of this. And then uh, if we run it through and train the model, we can then resynthesize that same sound. Uh, and what's interesting is that since we have all these different components, remember, we could actually just turn some of these components off. Um, like uh, this last one was like a room reverberation. So the, the impulse response of a room, which is just a single uh, 1D convolution. And so if we turn off that reverb, then we could hear like, what would it be if we recorded this in an anarchaic chamber? Um, or similarly, like what is just the filtered noise component of the synthesis? Uh, and we can inspect all of the different attributes. So the, the pitch, here's like the amplitude of the oscillator. You can see the individual notes being present. Um, and then this is this distribution of the harmonics in terms of all the, the different timbres present. So we have this disentanglement due to the structure and interpretability due to the structure we put in ahead of time. Um, I'm gonna skip a few more things as we're running lower on time, uh, but uh, another thing we can do is, so we, we train this decoder, uh, but what we can do is uh, we can train it to represent the sound of a given instrument when it was given a pitch, uh, fundamental frequency, or F naught in this case, and a loudness, and we trained it to decode to a certain instrument, like uh, here's like a, some violin sample, right? But if we take the pitch and the loudness of that violin and then decode it with a model that was trained to turn pitch and loudness into a flute sound, then we can sort of transfer that sound into a flute. Uh, we can do this with a variety of sources as well. So we can take singing. This is one of our AI residents, Hanoi singing. Somewhere over the rainbow. And then this is him as a violin. Um, so we're able to do this thing we call timbre transfer, which is like changing the timbre or the tone based on that, uh, switching out the decoders. Um, and we, we found that a compelling experience. So we actually, uh, as to see how small we can make these models and how efficient, we saw that we could actually implement them on the browser. So instead of using a GPU and taking hours to create a second of audio, we have real time operation uh, with models compressed down to as small as under a megabyte as opposed to models that are gigabytes large. Um, and so we were able to make these sort of interactive experiences. Um, like in this example, uh, we could uh, take this Carnatic Indian singer. It's actually a very talented Googler who lent us her voice. Um, and what's nice about these models is they don't work on this representation of notes so much, but a lower level representation of pitch tracks. Um, so many styles of music like Carnatic, Carnatic music rely on um, uh, microtonal variations and shifts. So we're able to preserve that in doing a uh, timbre transfer. So here we do it to a violin and a flute, and then we back up her voice with this uh, ensemble. <laughs> So it was really a helpful exercise for us in terms of thinking a bit more introspectively about how the constraints we build into a model um, restrict the use of that model and might apply to some cultures and not other cultures. So here the DDSP model was able to apply to a broader range of cultures, whereas previously the, the models we were working with with the piano might not have worked as well because there wasn't as clear of a note-based representation for some of those um, microtonal variations. We also, uh, if you want to play with this yourself, we made another web uh, application called Tone Transfer, uh, and it gives some examples and actually allows you to do that uh, in real time uh, on the browser. 
Um, and we really liked, since we're trying to empower a creative agency, we, we were very happy with the response that we got that a lot of people, musicians felt that this was really helpful to them in their process instead of being something to replace their process. Um, and uh, it's very memeable as well. Just an example, here's Hanoi uh, doing a little Twitter TikTok thing. That's fun. Uh, and yeah, and we're working on a broader ecosystem here to make it more useful to musicians. So giving a web interface to allow people to train their own models. Um, because it takes so little data, people could train personal models and then um, deploying to web apps and even real time plugins for music software. Um, so DDSP, if we think about it along these axis, comes out pretty well. It's much more interactive. It's real time, small models uh, that it is uh, interpretable and manipulable at all the different sort of levels of the representation. Uh, it's adaptive because it uses strong product priors. We can learn from very little data. Um, but in terms of expressivity, it's still plus or minus because when it works, it sounds very realistic. But the examples I've shown to you were designed very carefully in the sense that we've limited ourselves to monophonic or single instrument music because that's built in uh, bias of the model. It's a built in prior of the model is that, um, that that's the structure. So as opposed to a waveform model that might be able to model uh, more instruments. So, uh, it's uh, there's questions about how to learn that right structure to model the different uh, uh, pieces of data that you would like to model. Which comes to these, these next questions of what things we're working on, um, looking at creating more expressive and diverse range of interactive models. Um, so getting the right labels to do that. And in order to do that, we're also looking at how can we learn that structure and learn those uh, labels from uh, unlabeled data. So from so we're looking at large scale self-supervised models or unsupervised models uh, in order to be do that. And uh, I think I'm running up on time. So I'm going to skip this last little section about how we use DDSP to do a little bit of that and just go to the summary that, yeah, so our goal was to optimize for creative agency, um, try to make things more interactive and adaptive without ex uh, sacrificing expressive power. I showed you a couple examples of how incorporating structure models has helped us to do a bit of that um, to help promote agency in the, with these systems. Uh, there's a whole lot more. You can go to g.co slash magenta and check out. We have a blog. We have uh, a bunch of demos and software. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of web demos you can try out. Um, also, Colab Notebooks if you want to try out some of the code and, and, and uh, try running some models yourself. Um, and Magenta JS uh, is great for the web hackers among you if you want to um, be able to make your own interactive uh, web applications. And uh, we even have a couple of professional tools in terms of uh, if you use Ableton Live or different uh, audio software, you can you can try some of these tools out in your uh, own workflow. So uh, this work has been done with collaborations of uh, many collaborators, large group over time. So I uh, thank you to all of all of them and thank to you to you guys for listening. Uh, if I have time, I'd be happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you so much. Jesse. It was really interesting. Uh, are there questions for Jesse? I think that what you are doing is very fascinating and uh, it reminds me how, um, you know, having this let's let's put it this way i think that what you are doing is a combination of passion for art and music and really taking um those lessons that we learn in you know for instance uh, probabilities and stochastic processes signal processing and and then deep learning and putting them all together to create yet another type of art. So this is really fascinating to me. And I think that through your talk, sometimes I was thinking, wow, now I can see why, for instance, um, 
it was important for me to learn something about signals and systems or you know probability or something and uh, i got inspired and i wish i was a uh, uh, an intern in your group, so I could also collaborate on these cool projects. So, but also, yeah. if the students have questions, uh, is sure. Uh, one anecdote that's kind of interesting is that, like, what we're doing is the same that people have been doing for a very long time. So, the original um, drum machines, like the 808, were designed to be realistic drums sounds uh, based on the signal processing knowledge that people knew at the time. Um, and the problem was that just what they had wasn't, they couldn't make anything very realistic out of it. It didn't sound very realistic, but the limitations of the model of those, of those drum machines they made actually turned out to be their defining characteristic. So if you listen to the radio at like 85% of what you hear is an 808 kick drum, you know, the doo -doo, um, and it's all because it was just not able to make a realistic sounding kick drum, but uh, hip hop and electronic musicians really gravitated towards that beautiful uh, failures of that, of, that, of that system. So in one way of thinking about what we do is we aspire to make systems that can fail in beautiful ways uh, that, that people will be able to use in fun artistic uh, manners. Excellent. Any questions? Okay. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, Thanks so much for such an interesting talk. Uh, I was going to ask, uh, one of them was about <clears throat> the way that you consider the role that interpretability plays in interactivity, um, because of course I can understand the power of making something lightweight and something that you can use in an interactive settings with sort of interaction thresholds, but uh, in the context of interpretability, it seems like uh, a lot of us who use modern sophisticated audio software have limited capabilities to reason about what they're doing already even when they're doing sort of inherently interpretable signal processing things uh, mm -hmm. and there are sort of level, different levels at which we reason about the, the things that they're doing and i'm wondering if you have any either principled approaches or ideas about what kinds of interpretability are important yeah I totally and this is one of the sort of most interesting questions i think that's sort of sitting in front of us at the moment one of the things we're really interested in working on which is the way I think about it is I think of it as an API between the software and the person. Um, it's the representations that you choose to communicate through. Um, and so like you were saying, um, uh, an API like uh, the uh, like a piece of software that's like, here, I'm showing you how to modulate all the wavetables and all the things, that takes a level of expertise on the part of the user to know what to do with all of that. Um, so they might not be speaking the same language for the software and the user from one perspective, but a different user might understand all that and, you know, that might be a good communication level API. So that language that's chosen as an intermediate one is an interesting thing because um, the question is how much of that language do you constrain to be something that is known ahead of time? versus how much of that language is something that you define through forcing the model to learn how to, how to, how to speak that language. So an example is, are we, are we doing it by changing the model architecture manually, or are we doing it by giving the model labels that it has to know how to speak, and then letting the model figure out how to speak those labels? So the example I showed with the note synthesis, um, for the synthesis there, we weren't constraining the synthesis algorithm at all. We were just giving it notes and saying, do your best now to play these notes. You know, give, uh, and so notes is then the language of the intermediate, you know, the API. Um, I think one of the challenges though, is with sort of large black box function approximators, which is what neural networks are, is that they have a, a good ability to interpolate within a given data regime but a poor ability to extrapolate outside of that. And so uh, one of the challenges is, I think it's important to make strong assumptions within the modeling, like, like change the network in severely constrained ways and then jump between different constraints, because I think that helps for generalization. Um, because then those, it's sort of like um, how Newtonian mechanics to first approximation actually generalize really well to so many situations. And it's because there's so few parameters involved. 
So it had to be just the right parameter and just the right equation to generalize at least to first order to many situations. So we don't know how to do that yet well with neural networks. What we know how to do is we can em emulate Newtonian mechanics in a specific set of images using millions and millions of parameters. But then when we try to extrapolate by just changing one aspect of the image, all of a sudden it falls apart because it was paying attention to a bunch of factors that weren't really the essence of the mechanics. It was like, oh, the color of the background is important and these types of things. So that's this trade-off of, of both from the model perspective, how do you enforce structure to help it generalize? And then from the communication with people perspective, how do you design models to be able to fit the target audience? You know, if, if I just want to be able to turn up the you know, um, dope knob, how dope is this music? You know, like, what does that mean? But if it, like, there's a single knob that I can turn to do that or just the intensity of, you know, the kick drum or something like that, you know? So um, building models that can adapt in that way is really interesting, especially when we start thinking about natural language as an API, because there's models that are better able to speak uh, language like English or other, other language. So can we use that as a way to co-design um, interfaces between people and models. Thanks so much, really interesting. Sorry, excellent, um, yeah, go ahead. Just a quick question. Uh, also, thank you for this. This is super, super cool. And I'm excited to look into these papers more. Um, question I have is, have any like, you know, like large producers or musicians reached out to you guys, like asking to collaborate or anything. Like, I've actually seen the Andrew Huang video on like um, the like instrument tool, but like, have any other people like reached out and have any collaborations? Yeah, yeah, a few have. We have the challenge that we're only like five or six people, and uh, frankly, when it, when we go off for promotion, we're based on whether we did research, not whether we did some cool collaboration with some artists. So uh, we do have like limitations based on. Uh, how much we can engage because they take a lot of time to do those types of collaborations. We've done a few things with um, like we did one thing with the Flaming Lips, which if you're older like me, they, they, they're they a pretty big band, but I don't, you know, whatever. Um, and uh, there was another uh, band called Yacht that did a full album with our music um, back when with our with our algorithms back when they were much more rudimentary. Um, so that took a lot of engagement, but was actually a fruitful process for us because we got a lot of iterations with them and feedback. Uh, and there's been a lot of other uh, things that have sort of come and gone and almost come to fruition uh, in terms of big name uh, things. But uh, it is, yeah, it is one of the side benefits of my job that every once in a while I get to interact with um, some musicians that I uh, really respect. Super cool. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, we are. Um, uh, kind of out of time, but uh, just wanted to mention that this also reminds me of how it is important to think about, you know, going out of distribution and compositionality that we, in a way, uh, we have discussed, we have been discussing in the class. And I think this is a grand challenge, uh, one of the grand challenges at the moment for all of these deep learning models, whether it is music or NLP or image, or any type of uh, domain that you want to. Uh, and this work is also one of the inspiring uh, type of work that could hopefully give us some insight about compositionality and this type of challenge. Thank you so much, Jesse. I really appreciate your time. Um, I know that uh, you have a time difference. So you are in California and we are in Cambridge. So I appreciate that you came uh, kind of early in the morning and gave us this very intriguing talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. It was, it was a pleasure. Thank you.